The Doom That Came to Sarnath by H. P. Lovecraft There is in the land of Manar a vast still lake that is fed by no stream and out of which no stream flows. Ten thousand years ago there stood by its shore the mighty city of Sarnath, but Sarnath stands there no more. It is told that in the immemorial years when the world was young, before ever the men of Sarnath came to the land of Manar, another city stood beside the lake, the grey stone city of Ib, which was old as the lake itself, and peopled with beings not pleasing to behold. Very odd and ugly were these beings, as indeed are most beings of a world yet inchoate and rudely fashioned. It is written on the brick cylinders of Cadatheron that the beings of Ib were in hue as green as the lake and the mists that rise above it, that they had bulging eyes, pouting, flabby lips, and curious ears, and were without voice. It is also written that they descended one night from the moon in a mist, they in the vast still lake and the grey stone city Ib. However this may be, it is certain that they worshipped a sea-green stone idol chiselled in the likeness of Bokrug, the great water lizard, before which they danced horribly when the moon was gibbous. And it is written in the papyrus of Larnak that they one day discovered fire, and thereafter kindled flames on many ceremonial occasions. But not much is written of these beings, because they lived in very ancient times, and man is young and knows little of the very ancient living things. After many eons men came to the land of Manar, dark shepherd folk with their fleecy flocks who built Thra, Larnek, and Kedathron on the winding river Ai. And certain tribes more hardy than the rest pushed on to the border of the lake and built Sarnath at a spot where precious metals were found in the earth. Not far from the grey city of Ib did the wandering tribes lay the first stones of Sarnath, and at the beings of Ib they marvelled greatly. But with their marvelling was mixed hate, for they thought it not meet that beings of such aspect should walk about the world of men at dusk. Nor did they like the strange sculptures upon the grey monoliths of Ib, for those sculptures were terrible with great antiquity. Why the beings and the sculptures lingered so late in the world, even until the coming of men, none can tell, unless it was because the land of Manar is very still and remote from most other lands, both of waking and of dream. As the men of Sarnath beheld more of the beings of Ib, their hate grew, and it was not less because they found the beings weak and soft as jelly to the touch of stones and spears and arrows. So one day the young warriors, the slingers and the spearmen and the bowmen, marched against Ib and slew all the inhabitants thereof, pushing the queer bodies into the lake with long spears because they did not wish to touch them. And because they did not like the grey sculptured monoliths of Ib, they cast these also into the lake, wondering from the greatness of the labour how ever the stones were brought from afar, as they must have been, since there is naught like them in all the land of Manar, or in the lands adjacent. Thus of the very ancient city of Ib was nothing spared, save the sea-green stone idol chiselled in the likeness of Bukrug, the water lizard. This the young warriors took back with them to Sarnath as a symbol of conquest over the old gods and beings of Ib, and a sign of leadership in Manar. But on the night after it was set up in the temple, a terrible thing must have happened, for weird lights were seen over the lake, and in the morning the people found the idol gone, and the high priest Taranish lying dead, as from some fear unspeakable. And before he died, Taranish had scrawled upon the altar of Chrysolite with coarse, shaky strokes the sign of doom. After Taranish there were many high priests in Sarnath, but never was the sea-green stone idol found. And many centuries came and went wherein Sarnath prospered exceedingly, so that only priests and old women remembered what Taranish had scrawled upon the altar of Chrysolite. Betwixt Sarnath and the city of Larnek arose a caravan route, and the precious metals from the earth were exchanged for other metals, and rare cloths and jewels and books and tools for artificers and all things of luxury that are known to the people who dwell along the winding river A and beyond. So Sarnath waxed mighty and learned and beautiful, and sent forth conquering armies to subdue the neighbouring cities, and in time there sate upon a throne in Sarnath the kings of all the land of Manar, and of many lands adjacent. 
the wonder of the world and the pride of all mankind was Sarnath the Magnificent. Of polished desert quarried marble were its walls, in height three hundred cubits and in breadth seventy-five, so that chariots might pass each other as men drave them along the top. For full five hundred stadia did they run, being open only on the side toward the lake, where a green stone sea wall kept back the waves that rose oddly once a year at the festival of the destroying of Ib. In Sarnath were fifty streets from the lake to the gates of the caravans, and fifty more intersecting them. With onyx were they paved, save those whereon the horses and camels and elephants trod, which were paved with granite. And the gates of Sarnath were as many as the landward ends of the streets, each of bronze, and flanked by the figures of lions and elephants carven from some stone no longer known among men. The houses of Sarnath were of glazed brick and chalcedony, each having its walled garden and crystal lakelet. With strange art were they builded, for no other city had houses like them, and travellers from Thra and Ilarnek and Kidathron marvelled at the shining domes wherewith they were surmounted. But more marvellous still were the palaces and the temples and the gardens made by Zokar the olden king. There were many palaces, the least of which were mightier than any in Thra or Ilarnek or Kidathron. So high were they that one within might sometimes fancy himself beneath only the sky. Yet when lighter with torches dipped in the oil of Dothua, their walls showed vast paintings of kings and armies, of a splendour at once inspiring and stupefying to the beholder. Many were the pillars of the palaces, all of tinted marble, and carven into designs of surpassing beauty. And in most of the palaces the floors were mosaics of beryl and lapis lazuli, and sardonyx and carbuncle and other choice materials, so disposed that the beholder might fancy himself walking over beds of the rarest flowers. And there were likewise fountains, which cast scented waters about in pleasing jets arranged with cunning art. Outshining all others was the palace of the kings of Manar, and of the lands adjacent. On a pair of golden crouching lions rested the throne, many steps above the gleaming floor, and it was wrought of one piece of ivory, though no man lives who knows whence so vast a piece could have come. In that palace there were also many galleries, and many amphitheatres where lions and men and elephants battled the pleasure of the kings. Sometimes the amphitheatres were flooded with water conveyed from the lake in mighty aqueducts, and then were enacted stirring sea-fights, or combats betwixt swimmers and deadly marine things. Lofty and amazing were the seventeen tower-like temples of Sarnath, fashioned of a bright multicoloured stone not known elsewhere. A full thousand cubits high stood the greatest among them, wherein the high priests dwelt with a magnificence scarce less than that of the kings. On the grounds were halls as vast and splendid as those of the palaces, where gathered throngs in worship of Zokala and Tamash and Lobon, the chief gods of Sarnath, whose incense enveloped shrines were as the thrones of monarchs. Not like the icons of other gods were those of Zokalar and Tamash and Lobon, for so close to life were they that one might swear the graceful bearded gods themselves sate on the ivory thrones. And up unending steps of shining zircon was the tower chamber, wherefrom the high priests looked out over the city and the plains and the lake by day, and at the cryptic moon and significant stars and planets and their reflections in the lake by night. Here was done the very secret and ancient rite in detestation of Bokrug the water lizard, and here rested the altar of chrysolite, which bore the doom scroll of Taranish. Wonderful likewise were the gardens made by Zokar the Olden King. In the centre of Sarnath they lay, covering a great space and encircled by a high wall, and they were surmounted by a mighty dome of glass, through which shone the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was clear, and from which were hung fulgent images of the sun and moon and stars and planets when it was not clear. In summer the gardens were cooled with fresh, odorous breezes skilfully wafted by fans, and in winter they were heated with concealed fires, so that in those gardens it was always spring. There ran little streams over bright pebbles, dividing meads of green and gardens of many hues, and spanned by a multitude of bridges. Many were the waterfalls in their courses, and many were the lilied lakelets into which they expanded. Over the streams and lakelets rode white swans, 
whilst the music of rare birds chimed in with the melody of the waters. In ordered terraces rose the green banks, adorned here and there with bowers of vines and sweet blossoms, and seats and benches of marble and porphyry, and there were many small shrines and temples where one might rest or pray to small gods. Each year there was celebrated in Sarnath the feast of the destroying of Ib, at which time wine, song, dancing, and merriment of every kind abounded. Great honours were then paid to the shades of those who had annihilated the old ancient beings, and the memory of those beings and of their elder gods was derided by dancers and lutenists crowned with roses from the gardens of Zokar. And the kings would look out over the lake and curse the bones of the dead that lay beneath it. At first the high priests liked not these festivals, for there had descended amongst them queer tales of how the sea-green icon had vanished, and how Taranish had died from fear and left a warning. And they said that from their high tower they sometimes saw lights beneath the waters of the lake. But as many years passed without calamity, even the priests laughed and cursed and joined in the orgies of the feasters. Indeed, had they not themselves in their high tower often performed their very ancient and secret rite in detestation of Bokrog the water lizard? And a thousand years of riches and delight passed over Sarnath, wonder of the world and pride of all mankind. Gorgeous beyond thought was the feast of the thousandth year of the destroying of Ib. For a decade had it been talked of in the land of Manar, and as it drew nigh there came to Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, men from Thra, Ilanek, and Kedatheron, and all the cities of Manar and the lands beyond. Before the marble walls on the appointed night were pitched the pavilions of princes and the tents of travellers, and all the shore resounded with the song of happy revellers. Within his banquet hall reclined Nargis Hai, the king, drunken with ancient wine from the vaults of conquered Panath, and surrounded by feasting nobles and hurrying slaves. There were eaten many strange delicacies at that feast. Peacocks from the isles of Nariel in the Middle Ocean, young goats from the distant hills of Implan, heels of camels from the Benazic Desert, nuts and spices from Sidathrian groves, and pearls from wave-washed metal dissolved in the vinegar of Thra. Of sauces there were an untold number, prepared by the subtlest cooks in all Manar, and suited to the palate of every feaster. But most prized of all the viands were the great fishes from the lake, each of vast size, and served up on golden platters set with rubies and diamonds. Whilst the king and his nobles feasted within the palace, and viewed the crowning dish as it awaited them on golden platters, others feasted elsewhere. In the tower of the great temple the priests held revels, and in pavilions without the walls the princes of neighbouring lands made merry. And it was the high priest Ginai Kar who first saw the shadows that descended from the gibbous moon into the lake, and the damnable green mists that arose from the lake to meet the moon, and to shroud in a sinister haze the towers and the domes of fate at Sarnath. Thereafter those in the towers and without the walls beheld strange lights on the water, and saw that the grey rock Akurion, which was wont to rear high above it near the shore, was almost submerged. And fear grew vaguely yet swiftly, so that the princes of Vilanek and of Far Rokol took down and folded their tents and pavilions, and departed for the river Eye, though they scarce knew the reason for their departing. Then, close to the hour of midnight, all the bronze gates of Sarnath burst open and emptied forth a frenzied throng that blackened the plain, so that all the visiting princes and travellers fled away in fright. For on the faces of this throng was writ a madness born of horror unendurable, and on their tongues were words so terrible that no hearer paused for proof. Men whose eyes were wild with fear shrieked aloud of the sight within the king's banquet hall, where through the windows was seen no longer the forms of Nogis High and his nobles and slaves, but a horde of indescribable green voiceless things with bulging eyes, pouting flabby lips and curious ears, things which danced horribly bearing in their paws golden platters set with rubies and diamonds containing uncouth flames. And the princes and travellers, as they fled from the doomed city of Sarnath on horses and camels and elephants, looked again upon the mist-begetting lake, and saw the grey rock Akurion was quite submerged. 
Through all the land of Manar and the lands adjacent spread the tales of those who had fled from Sarnath, and caravans sought that accursed city and its precious metals no more. It was long ere any traveller went thither, and even then only the brave and adventurous young men of distant Falona dared make the journey, adventurous young men of yellow hair and blue eyes, who are no kin to the men of Manar. These men indeed went to the lake to view Sarnath, but though they found the vast still lake itself, and the grey rock Akurion which rears high above it near the shore, they beheld not the wonder of the world and pride of all mankind. Where once had risen walls of three hundred cubits and towers yet higher, now stretched only the marshy shore, and where once had dwelled fifty millions of men, now crawled only the detestable green water lizard. Not even the mines of precious metal remained, for doom had come to Sarnath. But half buried in the rushes was spied a curious green idol of stone, an exceedingly ancient idol coated with seaweed and chiselled in the likeness of Bokrug, the great water lizard. That idol, enshrined in the high temple at Larnak, was subsequently worshipped beneath the gibbous moon throughout the land of Minar.